morning, Countryside. I'm Mike Summers. I'm looking forward to our time in the Word and in worship this morning. Before our service begins, let's go over just a, a couple of announcements. First, I want to remind you that we have a baptismal service coming up next month. It will be Sunday morning, March 17th. Actually, today is the deadline to contact the church if you want to be baptized. So if you'll send the church an email or just reach out to one of the pastors before you leave, we'll make sure that we set up an interview. Next, please be on the lookout for registrations for our summer camps. Our teen camp registration will be open March in March, and our junior camp registration will be open soon as well. There will be more information released about these camps in the coming weeks, and we'll make sure that you get what information you need. Lastly, I want to let all of our men know that our annual men's stakeout outreach, outreach event is coming up on May 4th. It will be here at Countryside from 3.30 to 7.30. Listen, this is a really special outreach event, so men, make sure you put it on your calendar so that nothing else gets in the way. Remember, that's May 4th. Well, at this time, I'd like to invite you to please stand as we open our worship service from the words that are recorded in Psalm 19, verse 14. It says, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight. O oh Lord, my rock and my redeemer, let's worship together.
a great song. It's not just for Easter, you know. Isn't it good to sing of a resurrected Christ, alive, interceding for us? Uh, before we go to prayer, or as we go to prayer, if you have not yet picked up a communion packet and you'd like to celebrate with us, if you are someone who is a believer in Christ, please do so. Uh, we'll do that in just a little bit. Let's pray together. Father, we're so grateful that we serve a risen Lord and Savior who is supreme over heaven and earth, who has conquered sin and death and seated at the right hand of the Father until his enemies are made his footstool and he comes to reign and conquer as king. We thank you, God, for being such a faithful and good and loving and great God. I want to pray for our uh, worship this morning, that we would be able to see Jesus through the scriptures, that the Spirit of God would use it in our lives, that as we give to you, that you would be blessed with what we give back out of what you've provided for us, that as we worship you in song and as we worship you through the receiving of your word, you'd be honored and glorified in our attitudes, in our hearts. We also want to pray for our sister churches in Brazil, Mexico, that you would just uh, glorify yourself as the Word of God is proclaimed today there, as believers are encouraged and strengthened in the faith, and those that are lost come to see Christ through the gospel. We pray that you would just bless in those areas. Redemption Hill Church, as the believers there are encouraged through the gospel of Luke and challenged and see Jesus life and ministry, that you would strengthen that church and help them to be salt and light in that place. And then as we celebrate communion, we want to recognize and see Christ, and we want to honor you with the way that we approach communion. Would you be glorified? Would you encourage our hearts? Would you speak to us through the truth that's communicated in communion? We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. And as we do each time we celebrate communion, this is something that is for uh, believers. So if you're a born-again Christian, we invite you to participate with us. Um, you don't have to, but we would love for you to. If you are not a believer, you're under church discipline, we'd ask that you um, just kind of sit back, not participate. That sounds strange to some people. I know. Uh, if you're new, say, what do you mean church discipline? Uh, what do you mean unbelievers? Can't everybody have communion? Well, Scripture tells us no. Uh, scripture indicates that communion um, has to be entered into in a way that we, um, we reflect and honor Christ, that we don't do it in an unworthy manner, that we don't discern the body and blood of the Lord. And those who are under church discipline have a sin that they have not repented of, that they've not made right. Those who are lost have never entered into a relationship with Christ. So it's for believers only, and uh, we would encourage you, if you're a Christian, to participate with us. But as we do, we have a time of examination every week, and this is just a, a moment for you to sort of hit pause and to stop and ask God to e examine you, to evaluate, is there sin that's dishonoring to the God that I've not confessed this week in my life? This is your opportunity to do that, sort of come clean and that's actually what Jesus went to the cross for, is to forgive you, to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. And it gives you an opportunity to do that. So why don't we take a moment, go before the Lord, and uh, experience his cleansing as we confess our sin. We're so glad, Lord, that we serve a merciful and gracious God who is eager, willing to cleanse us. We thank you for just the finished work of Christ on the cross that makes us acceptable in your sight. We're glad we don't have to jump through hoops to try to make you love us or even like us, that you 
unconditionally do that. And you've demonstrated that love through Jesus. Now as we celebrate his death on the cross for sin, would you bring things into sharper focus for us? We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Well, before we participate in communion together, I want to just highlight three significant components that are part of the communion that we celebrate every week. First, as we celebrate communion, there is a memorial aspect to communion where we remember something. We come to remember. Each week, we use this time of communion to focus on Jesus and what he accomplished on the cross in order to bring us into a saving relationship with God. We do this not because we don't know these things. It's because we need to be constantly reminded of them. During Jesus' final Passover with his disciples in that upper room, you know, he did something very significant. He actually changed the focus of that Passover meal from the lambs that were slain in order to bring Israel out of Egypt to a different focus, to his own death that would deliver sinners from eternal judgment. So he changed the focus. He said concerning the bread and the wine, he said, do this in remembrance of me. Not in mem remembrance of the Passover lambs, but in remembrance, remembrance of me. And that's what we do. That's what we do. During communion, we intentionally remember Jesus' death. So the bread points to Jesus' body that was broken. The, the juice points to Jesus' blood that was shed. But there's a, a second component to communion that we celebrate each week. There is a, a personal component, component where we engage. We personally engage. Uh, we don't come to this time of our service as observers. We come as participants. We actually do something. I want you to listen to the directives that are given by our Lord concerning communion. In Matthew 26, Jesus said, take, eat. That's something that you do. They're verbs. Take, eat. He said in, uh, in Matthew 26, drink, all of it. So drink, something that you do. In Mark 14, he said, take. In Luke 22, Jesus said, do this. And in 1 Corinthians 11, where Paul's commenting on how we are to observe the Lord's table, he recounts Jesus' words, and he records that Jesus said, do this twice. Do this in relationship to the bread. Do this in relationship to the juice. So there's a personal component, component to communion in the sense that we are not passive observers. We are active participants. We engage. We take. We eat. We drink. So have you ever wondered... Why not? Why do we eat and drink? Why don't we just look at the bread and look at the juice and think about what these symbols indicate? And we can certainly do that. And I think it would be meaningful to do that as we just think about them. But why do we eat and drink? Well, it's because Jesus intends for us to taste and to consume these elements because we are those who have been redeemed by the broken body and the shed blood of our Lord. So think about when you were saved. When you were saved, you didn't just sit back and ponder Jesus through the gospel. After you heard the gospel, you personally received him, right? By faith, you received him. You personally trusted in him and his work on the cross. So why do we personally eat and drink? Well, eating this bread and, and drinking this juice actually takes us back to when we are saved. And it sort of emphasizes in the act of taking and eating and drinking, it emphasizes that we are personally trusting in him alone. We personally have received him as our Lord and Savior. So think about this. What, what do you think would happen if uh, for an entire month, three times a day, you just stood or sat and looked at the meal that was in front of you? You just looked at it. You never ingested the food. You never tasted. You just looked at it. For a month. What do you think would happen? 
I can tell you what would happen. You wouldn't live very long. In the same way, if when you were saved, when you heard the gospel, if you just observed Jesus, but you didn't receive him, you didn't trust in him, you couldn't be saved. Finally, there's a communal component, component to communion where we actually participate together. This is something that we don't do in isolation. You see, communion isn't just about you and your relationship with Christ. It's also about us and our relationship with one another in Christ. So there's fellowship in communion in the, the fullest sense because we go back to the cross together and we worship the Lord who made us his children, who put us into the family of God. So this morning, let's remember, let's engage, and let's participate together as brothers and sisters who are united through the broken body and the shed blood of our Lord. So if you'll take your communion packet and take off the cellophane top, as you do that, Andrew Rogow is going to pray before we eat together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for sending your Son to be uh, the sacrifice for us, for uh, giving his, his body that this bread symbolizes. Pray that you would um, teach us to uh, live lives that are broken before you, um, just like his body was broken, uh, hum humble and repentant of our sin, ready to turn to you for the forgiveness that we offer. We thank you, Lord, for all your love that you've shown upon us. Amen. So the bread that we hold in our hands is not the body of the Lord. It doesn't become the body of our Lord. Um, we eat because it represents the body of the Lord that was broken for us, that we believed died so we could be saved. So let's eat together in remembrance of him. Go ahead and pull the top off the juice. As you do that, Bo Lynch is going to pray before we drink together. Lord, we're so thankful that we get to engage in your table, Lord, as a church. Lord, I'm so thankful that you took someone like me, Lord, wicked and Lord, full of conceit and chose me to be an instrument for you. Lord, I pray that you would continue to mold and fashion each one of us, Lord, as we are a specific piece to your body. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So in, in the same way, this juice is not the blood of Jesus. That's kind of gross. It's not, it doesn't become the blood. It's juice. But it symbolizes the blood of Jesus that was shed for us. And why do we drink it? We drink it because it's through the blood of Jesus that we were redeemed. It's through the blood of Jesus we are forgiven. It's through the blood of Jesus that we are reconciled to holy God. So let's drink in remembrance of him. Amen. I encourage you to um, stand and uh, we'll continue worshiping the Lord.
Father, we thank you for the privilege that we have of worshiping such a good and faithful God who is in control of our lives today and all of our tomorrows. And we thank you, God, for being so great and yet being so thoughtful for us as your creatures, for redeeming us, for having a purpose to conform us to your image and then bringing about that purpose to completion by glorifying us one day. Thank you, God. As we turn our attention to Scripture, we pray we would see Jesus more clearly than we have before. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. And be seated, please. As you're getting situated, I invite you to turn in your Bibles to Colossians chapter 1, if you will again. Colossians chapter 1. I know many of you have uh, read through all of Scripture. Uh, there's a good number of you that have read some of Scripture, and probably all of you have heard something from Scripture at one point or another. Well, if you have, you know this, that the Bible is clear that Jesus Christ is the revelation of God in human flesh. There is a storyline to the Bible. It's not just a uh, collection of random books. And central to the storyline of Scripture is that of the Messiah King. The Old Testament promises that this Messiah King will come. The New Testament declares that Jesus is the perfect Messiah King who came. And Scripture announces that He will one day come again as the triumphant King who will reign forever. So everything in Scripture is really dependent on the fact that Jesus is the Messiah, that He is the eternal King who is God, who came in the flesh and is coming again. So you think about it. Jesus existed in eternity past. He came to earth as God in human flesh. He was crucified to save sinners he was raised from the dead and ascended to heaven. And he will one day come again to reign throughout eternity. Now in light of the body of evidence in Scripture about Jesus being God, it's amazing how many people miss it. Jehovah Witnesses say that Jesus was merely God's first creation. That he was a perfect man, but... He was not God. 
Mormons say that Jesus was the first spirit to be born in heaven and that he was a God, not the God. He was actually the spirit brother of Lucifer. Muslims say that Jesus was a great prophet, second only to Muhammad. But he was not God and he never was crucified. Even many mainline Christian denominations teach that Jesus was a great teacher, that he was a fine example, but he wasn't God. He wasn't born of a virgin, he wasn't bodily raised from the grave, and they say he never claimed to be God. Well, regardless of who people think Jesus is, Scripture declares that Jesus is God. If Jesus is not God, then we're in big trouble. Because if Jesus is not God, his death on the cross accomplished nothing. Zero. Nada. We are then still in our sins. We have no hope of ever being forgiven and reconciled to God. So it's important that we understand Jesus' identity as God. Now the error that Paul addresses in Colossians was a hybrid of various philosophies. It included a, a mixture of pagan mysticism with Jewish legalism. And at the very heart of this teaching was the identity of Jesus Christ. This is why Paul is so passionate about holding up the supremacy of Jesus Christ as God. In fact, he said concerning Jesus in Colossians 2.9 that for in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. You can't get any clearer than that, that Jesus is God. Well, after highlighting the priority of believers being filled with the knowledge of God's will that we looked at for the last couple of weeks, Paul actually then gets to the main point of his letter. So he declares that the one who qualified us for our eternal inheritance and who delivered us from the power of darkness, and who transferred us to the kingdom of his Son, and who redeemed and forgave us from sin, is none other than Jesus Christ, the creator and sustainer of the universe, who is supreme over all that God created. I want to invite you to stand with me as we're going to do something a little different. We're going to read Colossians 1, 15 through 17 aloud together. As we do this, I know some of you are like, why do we have to stand? You don't have to stand. I just invited you to stand. <laughs> you can reject my invitation. But I want us to read this aloud. And so when we read Scripture loud in here, we don't read like, um, and he is the image of the image of God. We read loud, right? So join us. Let's read loud. Referring to Jesus, Paul wrote this. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and that on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things. And in him all things hold together. You can be seated and we can all just go home. That was glorious. I, uh, I love that. I love that. I think this scripture that you just read so wonderfully is perhaps the greatest declaration about Jesus Christ as God ever written by the Apostle Paul in any of his letters. The question that it answers is this. How do we know that Jesus is eternal God who is over all creation? And it discloses for us three foundational reasons in this answer. First, we know from verse 15 that Jesus is supreme because of who he is as God. Who he is as God. Look at verse 15. It says, he, referring to Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. So Jesus is not simply a great man or a moral teacher or a wise philosopher or a prophet from God. He is nothing less 
than the visible manifestation of God as God. And Paul proves this by holding up two foundational realities about Jesus' identity as God. First notice that Jesus' identity is seen in his essence as God. He is, Paul writes, the image of the invisible God. Now, think about this. He's the image of the invisible God. Doesn't the Bible say that you are created in the image of God? But you're not God. No, I know you're not God. Some of you think you are. You're not God. You're not God. So what does Paul mean when he says Jesus is the image of God? It's a legitimate question. Let's look at that for just a moment. The word image refers to a living manifestation. It's not a statue. It's not a painting. It's a, a living manifestation of something. So Paul's saying that Jesus is the living manifestation of the invisible God that you can't see. So this doesn't mean that Jesus merely resembles God. It means that he is all that God is. He's fully, he's perfectly, he's totally God. He reveals God. So we know that what God the Father is like because we see that in God the Son. In the upper room, if you remember, before Jesus' crucifixion, it's where they had the first Lord's Supper, Philip asked Jesus a question. He said, Lord, show us the Father and it will be enough for us. Show us the Father and it will be enough for us. Now what was Jesus' response? In John 14, 9, Jesus said to him, listen to this, have I been with you so long, and you still do not know me, Philip? And then powerful statement, whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Now, Jesus is not saying here that he is the Father. He is saying that in the same way that the Father is God, he too is God. So anyone who had seen Jesus had actually seen the very image of God. In John 10, verse 30, Jesus declared, I and the Father are one. We are one. We are each God in the Godhead. Now, the entire Gospel of John was written to show that Jesus was the revelation of God. It begins in John 1, 18 by saying, no one has ever seen God. Right? God's spirit. He's invisible. No one has ever seen God. And then notice what John says. He says, the only God, what God is that, who is at the Father's side, he has made him known. Powerful statement. Right off the bat, teaching the Father's God, the Son is God. Now, as the image of the invisible God, Jesus Christ actually enabled finite man to see what the infinite God is like. Referring to Jesus, the writer of Hebrews says in Hebrews 1 verse 3 that he is the radiance of the glory of God. Notice this. And the exact imprint of his nature. Isn't that great? Now God is spirit. And because of that, he's invisible. No one has ever seen him because spirit can't be seen. However, when God the Father sent God the Son into the world... He made himself visible to finite eyes. And in this sense, Jesus is the image of the invisible God. There was a, a mom who saw her young son drawing a picture, and she asked him, she says, well, Honey, what are you drawing? He said, I'm drawing a picture of God. And she says, Oh, honey, no one knows what God looks like. The boy says, well, they will when I get through. <laughs> That's actually what God was doing in sending Jesus Christ. Through his perfect life and his brutal death and his glorious resurrection, Jesus revealed what God is like. So Jesus' identity is seen in his essence as God. Secondly, Jesus' identity is seen in his preeminence as God. Paul says at the end of verse 15 that Jesus is the firstborn of all creation. Now, what in the world does this mean? The firstborn 
of all creation. Is this referring to Jesus' birth? Is Paul saying here that Jesus is part of creation? No. Paul's using the term firstborn in a technical sense that actually everybody in this church would have clearly understood. You see, in both Greek and Jewish cultures, the child who was designated with the title firstborn was the child that had the position of preeminence and who had the right of inheritance. You see, the title firstborn did not necessarily refer to the child who was born first chronologically. It was the child given the preeminent place positionally. We see this throughout Scripture with several people. One of the best illustrations is in Genesis 25, 33, of the two sons of Isaac, Esau and Jacob. Remember that? Well, although Esau was actually born first chronologically, it was Jacob who was declared the firstborn in regard to the blessing from his father Isaac. So the designation firstborn is a, a, a term indicating supremacy and preeminence. And so when Paul says that Jesus was the firstborn of all creation, he's not saying he was the first one born of all creation. He's just saying that he is the supreme one. Jesus is the preeminent one. Jesus is the one who is over all that has been created. But Mike, doesn't the phrase of all creation indicate that Jesus somehow was part of creation? Not at all. Sometimes the preposition of can mean being a part of something. For instance, if I told you I am preaching behind a pulpit of wood, what that would tell you is that the, the, the pulpit is wood. So the pulpit and the wood are part of the same thing. But if I said my son Michael is the coach of Tommy's team, you wouldn't assume that Michael is one of the players on a team of fifth and sixth graders. No. You would know that as a coach, he is apart from the team. He's actually over the team. In the same way as the firstborn of all creation, Jesus is not part of, of creation. He is outside his creation. He's over all creation as the preeminent one in the exalted position of firstborn. So the firstborn of all creation tells us who Jesus is as God. He's the supreme one. He is the one true God. He is the sovereign who is over all that's been created. But Jesus is not just supreme over all creation because of who he is as God. Notice secondly, in verse 16, Paul shows that Jesus is supreme over all creation because of what he did as God. And what did Jesus do? He created all things. Look at verse 16. For by him all things were created. Created where? Well, in heaven and on earth. Visible and invisible. Whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. You see, Jesus can't be part of creation and still be creator of all things. Now, there's two main statements in this verse that declare Jesus as the exalted creator of all things. What are they? Well, first, notice Paul emphasizes that all things were created by Jesus. Very simply, he says in the beginning of verse 16, for by him all things were created. In heaven and earth, visible, invisible. So everything in the universe came into existence through the creative act of the Son of God. In fact, Paul uses the word all things to stress that there was nothing created that Jesus didn't create. We see the same thing in John 1.3, where John says, All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. <clears throat> now, Paul wants to be sure that we don't miss the full scope of what it means that Jesus created all things in heaven and earth. And so he drills down and he includes things in heaven and earth 
that you can see as well as things that you can't see. What are they? Well, notice first, Jesus created all things that are visible. This refers to the things in creation that we can see in the heavens and on earth. Now, you and I live in an amazing time. Things that couldn't be seen in the heavens during Paul's day are able to be seen clearly in our day. I don't know if you've ever, in the last couple of years, gone on the NASA's website to look at some of the stunning photos that have been taken and sent back that come from deep space. Much more than what the Hubble telescope could do. It's fascinating to be able to see things that have never been able to be seen. This sort of came into focus for me it was just a, a couple of months after I was saved. Uh, I was in Toronto, Canada, and a group of us went to what was sort of the, the Canadian version of our Smithsonian Institute. Now, on this particular day, um, I was tired, I was a little discouraged, and um, I was just kind of wandering around, disinterested in just about everything. I sort of wandered away from the group, and I ended up into an area that illustrated the wonders of mathematics. Now, I must have been really down to be <laughs> there. But I went ahead and sat down, and in front of me was a screen, and it was called Powers of Ten, and I pushed the button. Now, some of you have seen this video. I think it was made in 1977, um, something that probably every fifth grader sees in science class, and of course I was an idiot, and I slept through all of that. Um, so this was new to me. And God used that particular exhibit to forever change my perspective about him. Uh, the narrator was giving some mathematical formula, multiplying distance and speed and time, all in powers of 10. So to illustrate what it would be like to travel one meter per second and then to travel uh, uh, 10 meters in, in, in two seconds and then 100 meter in three seconds, etc. You kind of follow that. So everything accelerates and the mass gets bigger. And it began by uh, focusing on a man who was laying on a blanket. So here's this guy. It's the 70s and so it looks cheesy. They're laying on a blanket and they're having a picnic. And the camera began moving up as if on sort of an invisible access or, or axis. And uh, immediately I noticed that the man is lying on some grass. And as the, the camera continued on that axis, I could then tell that the grass was part of a, a park. And then as it went up, I could tell that the park was in a city. And as it continued to move up, I could tell that the city was Chicago because Lake Michigan sort of came into focus. And then uh, Chicago was part of North America and then that North America was one of several continents as the shape of the earth sort of came into view. So you get the picture. We're just moving up and everything is getting smaller and smaller. In a few seconds, it traveled past the moon. And then a few seconds later, it passed a planet and then another planet. And then a bright flash appeared as it passed our sun. Very quickly then, we whizzed past the other planets in our solar system and and then a couple more seconds, we passed by some stars, really slowly at first, and then faster, and then faster, and soon the stars began to reveal the borders of our galaxy that sort of looked like a pinwheel, and we were sort of at the edge of that pinwheel, and the pinwheel then became sort of like a star itself, just a point of light as the camera moved beyond it, and then as it passed by other galaxies, they too looked like stars, and then it ended up in just darkness and that's when the camera stopped and I'm watching all this and I'm just awestruck not by the math I care less about the math I'm awestruck because the universe appeared way bigger than I ever imagined and I thought my God made all of this and I was right in that thinking because Psalm 102, verse 25 says, The heavens are the work of your hands. Well, the camera only stopped for a moment because it then began to return on the same axis that it had traveled. 
And on the way, way back, it passed by galaxies looking like stars, and then into the border of our galaxy, and then past the stars, and then the planets in our solar system, and then the sun, and then the moon, and then toward the earth. And as it neared earth, the continents came into view, and then North America, and then the city of Chicago, and then the park, and then this man lying on a blanket on the grass in the park. At this point, tears were just streaming down my face. I was so overwhelmed, but this wasn't the end. The camera then appeared to actually enter into the man's skin on the same axis. It went through his epidermis and then his dermis layer, and then it went into his bloodstream, and then into a cell, and then the components of the cell, we saw the strands of DNA, and then we came to the very heart of an atom, and then into a proton, and finally into the building blocks of that proton. So for the first time in my life, I became gripped with how vast and also how intricate God's creation actually is. So who is the God who is so immense and powerful that he simply spoke all this into existence? Who is the God that created all things that are visible? The Apostle Paul says it is the Lord Jesus Christ. The entire universe was made by Jesus. Do you know how big the universe is? I'm going to just give it a shot to try to give you some perspective. Think about the earth. The earth's, the earth's pretty huge, right? It has a diameter of 7,900 miles if you go from pole to pole. That's pretty big. But did you know that the sun is 109 times larger than the diameter of the earth? And the volume of the sun is actually 1.3 million times greater than the earth. So think about this. If the sun were the size of a bowling ball, it's about this big, the earth would be the size of a poppy seed in comparison. So that just gives you some spatial relation. But as far as stars go, the sun really isn't that big. There's many stars as much as a thousand times larger than our sun. So think about the size of the universe. Our sun is 93 million miles away from the earth, from the poppy seed. At that distance, it takes light to go about eight and a half minutes to travel from, from the sun to uh, earth. But for light to travel to Earth from the closest star that's in our solar system, it would take over four years. A lot of space. And to travel across our galaxy, it would take over 100,000 light years. Because one light year is six trillion miles. And get this. There are billions of galaxies in the universe with each galaxy containing an innumerable number of stars. So the universe is huge. How huge? Well, the most recent estimate is that the universe is at least 7 trillion light years in diameter. And who made all that? Paul declares it was Jesus who created all things visible. He's the creator of everything we can see. And how did he do this? How did he do it? Psalm 33, 6 says this. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, and by the breath of his mouth, all their host. So Jesus merely spoke, he merely commanded, and everything that you could possibly see through advanced telescopes shot deep into space came into existence out of nothing, by our Lord speaking them into existence. Think about this, and let it boggle your mind. It was easier for Jesus to create this universe than it is for you to think a casual thought. But Jesus didn't just create all things visible. We need to move on. Paul says, second, Jesus created all things that are invisible, he says, for by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. 
And we don't have to wonder what these invisible things are that Jesus created. Paul actually tells us. He says, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. These four designations refer to the, the various ranks or categories of angels that exist in the unseen world. We know from Scripture that the supernatural spirit world is highly organized. We just can't see it. So our question is, why would Paul mention the various ranks of angels? Why would he do that? Why wouldn't he just say, he created all things that you can see and that you can't see and move on? Well, one aspect of the error making its way into the church was that Jesus was an angelic being who had been created by God. This error said that Jesus should be worshipped, but worshipped as an angel along with other angels. So that's why in chapter 2, verse 18, for instance, Paul said this, Let no one disqualify you, insisting on asceticism and worship of angels. So Paul's emphasizing here that Jesus isn't an angelic being who had been created. In Colossians 1, he's emphasizing that Jesus is God who created the various kinds of angels. So every angel, whether it's a fallen angel or an elect angel, must ultimately answer to Jesus as its creator. Uh, Ephesians 1.21 says that Christ is at the right hand of the Father. He's exalted. Notice this. Far above, above what? All rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named. Not only in this age, but also in the one that is to come. So Jesus is no angel. As God, he's exalted above the angels, and all the angels are subject to him as creator. In fact, you can look there sometime. 1 Peter 3, 20, 20, uh, 22 says that angels, authorities, and powers have been all made subject to Jesus. So he created all things visible and invisible. In fact, Paul declares this twice in verse 16. He says, for by him all things were created. And then he says, all things were created through him. Just so that we don't question, we don't doubt. Now because Jesus made everything that exists, things that are visible and invisible, it means he possesses all power. And it means that he possesses all authority. This is his world. He made it. It belongs to him. He is the sovereign power and authority over all of creation. So Paul says all things were made or created by Jesus. But notice he doesn't stop there. Second, Paul says all things were created for Jesus. Look at the last part of verse 16. All things were created through him and for him. For him. Let this grab you. Jesus not only created all of it, it was created for him. It was created for his pleasure, it was created for his glory. What this means, practically, is that the goal of all creation is to glorify the Lord Jesus Christ as its creator. To glorify God is to reflect him by giving an accurate opinion of who he is. It's basically to put God on display so that others can see it and ooh and awe over it. And that's what creation does. Creation doesn't just exist. Creation does something. Psalm 19.1 says, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims His handiwork. That's pretty amazing. So anytime that an astronomer looks into a, a, t a telescope or interprets the data received from a telescope deep in space, he ought to be seeing something that brings him or her to their knees. It ought to be declaring that God is glorious and immense. In fact, one time I was talking to a guy, he's the, um, the, the lead professor um, over the, the whole astronomy department at a major university. You would know the university if I mentioned it. And uh, so we were at a reception together and we struck up a conversation. He asked what I did. <laughs> And so, uh, you know, I tell him that, and I ask what he did, and um, he says, well, I'm a you know, scientist, I'm an astronomer, I'm the head of the astronomy department at such and such university. And I said, man, I would love that job. He said, really, why? 
I said, because every day you get to look at the heavens and see them scream back to you about the glory of God. That you're confronted with an eternal God every day that you go to work. And he says, really? How, how is that? And I was able to take him to Psalm 19 and to show him that the reason that we exist is for God's glory, but the problem is man falls short of the glory of God. But that's not a problem because God sent his son to save us so that we could again glorify him and live with him forever. The interesting conversation. This answers the question, why you exist, dear friend? Why do you exist? Why do you exist? Listen, you exist because it pleased God to fashion a being according to his image who would be able to know and love and trust and obey and serve and glorify him. You exist because God wants a relationship with you for his glory. Romans eleven thirty six 36 says, For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever and ever. So why is Jesus supreme over all creation? Well, he's supreme because of who he is as God. He is the image of the invisible God. He's the firstborn of all creation. And he's also supreme because of what he did as God. He created all things visible and invisible for his glory. And then notice in verse 17, third, Jesus is supreme over all creation because of what he does as God. Now, since Jesus created all things, he obviously had to exist before all things came into existence, right? And so what does he do now in relation to his creation? Look at verse 17. It says, he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Now, the fact that Jesus is before all things means that he existed before all things came into existence. It indicates that before there was an earth, before there was a sun, before there were planets or stars or oxygen or matter or even time, Jesus always was. In fact, there has never been a time throughout all eternity when Jesus wasn't. And after Jesus created all things, he didn't just let go of his creation, take his hands off and see what was going to happen. You know, kind of like you did as a kid where you thought, I'm just going to throw this baseball through that window to see what will happen. That's not what Jesus did. No, Paul says in verse 17 that in him, powerful statement, all things hold together. So Jesus is not only the universe's creator, he's also its sustainer. Now most of you from your fifth grade science class know that atoms are considered the basic building blocks of matter and that matter uh, could be a, a leaf, it could be a planet, it could be a snail, it could be water, it could be anything, anything that's matter. Well, the nucleus of an atom contains things that are called protons, neutrons, and electrons. And each of these are comprised of what scientists call quarks, uh, Q-U-A-R-K-S. Now here's the mystery, and it is a mystery. A proton is a positively charged particle. Scientists and physicists have attempted to answer this question. Why are positively charged protons able to get close together and stay there? Since every proton has a positive charge, what they should do is repel each other and blow apart, but they don't. Scientists know that there's something that has to keep them together. And so they theorize that what keeps them from blowing apart is what they call a strong force. That's the scientific term, a strong force. They say that this force that causes cohesion is comprised of what are called gluons. They say that gluons are unobservable subatomic glue, for lack of a better word, gluon. Makes them sort of cling on to one another. But all of that is, is just theory. They don't know what holds them together, but you do. What actually holds everything together is not a mystery, and it's not a theory. The Bible says that through the Lord Jesus Christ, the creator and sustainer of the universe, all 
things hold together. By the way, just kind of a morbid thought, do you know what will happen when Jesus stops holding all things together? It'll be the end of cohesion. Scripture describes a day when that is going to happen. In 2 Peter 3.10, it says, The day of the Lord will come like a thief. That just simply means it's going to come unexpected, and it's just going to be upon you. What happens then? Well, then, the heavens will, what? Pass away with a roar. Try to imagine what that would be like. The heavens passing away with a roar. And the heavenly bodies, that will be like all the stars and the planets and everything, will be burned up. And then notice this. And dissolved. And the earth and the works that are done will be exposed. So one day, Jesus is going to let go and all of the elements that make up matter are going to become unglued. When that happens, the elements are going to melt. They're going to be burnt up. They're going to be dissolved. This will be, the best word to describe it, is an uncreation. It's an uncreation. And then according to Revelation 21 and verse 1, Jesus will create a new heaven and earth. The Apostle John says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. Notice this. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, dissolved, burnt up. And the sea was no more. So what's going to happen to the first heaven and earth? It's going to be done away with. It's going to dissolve into nothing. And the Lord is going to create a new heaven and a new earth. But until that day, the universe is held together by Jesus. He is the cohesion. And he continues to hold it together. The question is, how does Jesus do this? How does he do it? Well, the writer of Hebrew tells us. Hebrews 1.13 says, we looked, or 1.3 says, we looked earlier, that he is the radiance of the glory of God, the exact imprint of his nature. Notice this next statement. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. Jesus simply commands the elements by the word of his power to stay together, and guess what? They stay together. As the creator of the universe keeps everything functioning by the word of his power, all of the elements, including the celestial bodies in the universe, they all just stay in their orbits because Jesus keeps them there. So, this is, this is a lot of stuff in here, but I hope it's exciting. And the implications of this really are something that you ought to chew on all week. Just think about that, and you come up with a bunch of implications practically for you. But let me just give you some. Let me give you some. So, we've just seen that Jesus as God is the creator and sustainer of the universe, that he possesses all power and all authority. So here's practically for you to think about. What could you possibly be facing in your life today that is too big for him to handle? I mean, he created the universe. He holds it together. So what are you facing that's too big for him to handle? I think, wow. See, when you trust Jesus as God. You're not just trusting somebody who might be able to do something for you in a pinch. You're trusting the God, well, the God who Jeremiah 32, 27 says this, Behold, I am the Lord. That is all caps, L-O-R-D, Sovereign Lord. I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is anything too hard for me? It's a rhetorical question. The answer is absolutely not. You're the God of all flesh over all things. So this should urge us to call on him. Hey, do you realize that the God who did all this invites you into his presence to talk with him? That's why Ephesians 3.20 says, To him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think according to the power that's at work within us. Go to him with your issues. What are you facing? Talk to him about it. Cast your burdens on him. He can handle it. It's nothing. If he could create a universe with a word and with a word command everything to stay together, he can take care of your deal. Second, since all creation exists for Christ and his glory, you ought to seek to glorify him in every aspect of your life. So here's the practical implication. You were created for him. All things were created by him and for him. You're made for his glory. 
So let me ask you this. What needs to change for you to reflect Christ and to glorify Him in your life personally? What needs to change? What needs to change for you to glorify Him in your marriage? Because you know you sometimes have conflict. You know that you're sometimes a jerk. You are. We all are. Selfish, care only about us. What needs to change? What needs to change for him to be glorified in relationships with other people or in your job? Third, what does this passage tell you about the heart of a God who in light of how immense he is, how great and glorious he is, that he chose to love you and rescue you and save you from sin? Remember what we just looked at last week? That what he does for us, all of those things, He's redeemed us and he's transferred us from his, you know, from the, delivered us from the kingdom of darkness, transferred us to the kingdom of the sun, forgiven us. He's done all of those things. That's humbling. It says a lot about his love and his mercy and his grace. He cares about you. How many times have you in your mind say, God doesn't care about me, I'm just worthless. Some people have even said to me multiple times, well, why would I want to pray to God when he's got far more important things to, to do than to you know, deal with me. Boy, that is so self-centered. Shift from that to being God-centered. Man, he cares about you. Everything that this glorious God who spoke everything to existence, who is holding, he is holding molecules together at the far extreme ends of the universe. And he also intimately loves you as an individual. That should humble you and to feel loved and cared for. So if, finally, if you're not a believer, if you're not a Christian, what does this passage tell you about this God who then went to the cross and died for you? If you're not a Christian, what's keeping you from trusting Christ? Do you think your sin is too great for him to forgive? Of course it's not. Oh, I know what it is. You don't want to submit your life to someone like God to have authority over you. You need to turn from that. God cares for sinners. And God not only can transform your life now, but he can give you an eternity in heaven. So search the scriptures. See for yourself. See for yourself. And I'm confident that you're going to discover that the only hope that you have for eternity is Jesus Christ. Father, thank you for loving us. Thank you for this passage. It's just so rich, and I feel like we hardly touched it. But I pray that you would use, us to, use it to give us perspective, and that through it, that you would encourage someone here who's struggling, someone who's feeling down, somebody who's having a difficult time, somebody who's focused on themselves. May it lift them up out of that hard place. And I pray for the person here who's lost, someone who needs you, someone who has no hope and has tried to run their own lives, but they've run themselves ragged. God, would you, would you save that person this morning? We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I invite you to stand as we close this portion of our service. Hallelujah, all I have is Christ, hallelujah, Jesus is my life, I once was lost in darkness, and thought I knew
close with this from 11, Romans 11, 36. For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. Have a great day in the Lord.